Okay, good morning class. Today we're going to do a teach back on basically endocrine disorders and at the same time what? Gastrointestinal tract disorders, right? Or digestive system disorders. Um, if you will, if you have seen, of course, if you have read the book, you can see that these are commonly seen here in the United States and all throughout the world. And particularly with endocrine disorders, the most common would most likely be what? Diabetes mellitus, right? So it's important, therefore, and it's imperative that we get to know more about diabetes, right? Okay. So we know for a fact that when a patient suffers from diabetes mellitus or mellitus, what is the organ involved here? The pancreas, okay? So we have to differentiate what exactly is an endocrine gland versus an exocrine gland, right? Endocrine gland versus exocrine. What is found in exocrine glands that you do not find in endocrine glands? The ducts, right? So apparently, if it is a duct, this is the gland. The duct is essentially like a tube whereby substances can go through like this, right? But this tube here allows the passage of, for example, in the case of the skin, a sweat gland, the sweat or perspiration will travel from the gland into the duct and out on the surface of the skin. Same thing with your one. Sebaceous gland, right? The sebaceous gland secretes sebum or oil, allowing the oil from the gland to go out through the ducts into the skin surface. On the other hand, endocrine glands, what happens? No one. Ducts, but at the same time, it secretes what? It produces and secretes hormones, right? And therefore, what is necessary that you have to understand that there is what? What should it, how does it be able to reach its target organs? Okay, to the blood circulation, right? Blood circulation. Okay, so the endocrine gland, therefore, is surrounded by what? A blood vessel, right? Like this, okay? And therefore, Whatever secretion it has, it goes to the blood, and therefore it's able to reach its target organ, even though they do not have ducts, right? Very important, very, very basic, right? So, as you can clearly see here, let me just get the, uh, you can find that, let's get a piece of this, that when you look at these glands, there are four, what is essential is that because of the fact that they do not have ducts, therefore you need them to have blood vessels to allow the blood, to have the blood circulation. I was trying to look for it to see actually here on the right side, okay? So, let's erase this. Okay, so in, in diabetic patients, as we said, the pancreas is involved. And what makes the pancreas unique is that it's all both exocrine and endocrine. Exocrine because you have the ex pancreatic ducts, secreting pancreatic enzymes where? Into the duodenum, remember? So if this were your esophagus, stomach, right? And then this is the duodenum here. The pancreatic ducts from the pancreas will secrete enzymes. So that means the pancreas is an exocrine gland because of the presence of the ducts. You have a sinai or a sinus that secretes this gland, hormones, or enzymes, here for the purpose of chemical digestion, right? Okay. So on the other hand, the pancreas has the eyelids of what? Okay, Langerhans, right? And if you remember, the eyelids of Langerhans has different cells. The alpha cell, what does the alpha cell secrete? Okay. What about the beta cells? And what about the delta cells? Somatostatin, right? Okay. So I can see therefore that in diabetic patients, the main problem lies where? In the beta cell, the lack of insulin, right? 
So let's try to review and review anatomy and physiology of the beta cells of the pancreas. And for those of you, as I always tell my students here, if you were, was anybody here a former student of mine in anatomy? Most likely not, right? Well, most of you are only one person here, okay? Sam, Samuel, right? So do you remember, Samuel, what I compared the uh, insulin to like a what? What did I compare the insulin to? That's an analogy in your classroom. Do you remember? Is there something that um, you remember? You were my former student. The rest of them were not my former students. So, to make be really clear reference, but not to exactly what it was. Okay. Now, did you watch the YouTube videos that I have been showing to this class? Okay. Yes. What is it? A key. A key. Okay. What is this? And what is the purpose of the key? To open the door, right? The door we have over there. So for me to open the door, what kind of key do I need? The key that is specific what? See those grooves there? Okay. This key, if that is going to what? Fit the groove inside the doorknob, then it should open. Now if I use another key, will the other key be able to open? It won't. It has to have a complete fit, right? Same thing here. So pretend that this is what? A cell. Now what do cells need? Food in the form of glucose, sugar, right? Okay. So what is a cell? Nucleus, 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 cytoplasm. Now let's pretend that the cell membrane has doors in the form of doorknobs and doors. Let's say you have three here. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Okay. And the cell is surrounded by, just like any cell, it has to have blood, therefore it's surrounded by a capillary. What's a capillary? The smallest blood vessel, right? So the blood is here. So every time you eat, remember this, this is the, the mouth here, right? And you swallow the food, you chew the food, you swallow the food, like the one that I have here. If I were to demonstrate the food here, and if this food contains sugar, mm, what do I do with the food? Chewing is done, or better yet, I have Kit Kat here. What does Kit Kat contain? You want some? Okay. Why are we laughing? Talking with my mouth full. So what happens? Mm, 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 mm. And what happens? I chew the food, I swallow the food, go to do my of this. Go there, grinding action, guess what? In the form of chyme, enter the small intestine, the duodenum. What the pancreas will secure to be what? Amylase, okay? What is that for? Starch, carbohydrates, right? Actually in your mouth, you already have saliva body amylase. So, it becomes digested. What do we do the next step after digestion? Broken down into small particles because what is the next step? What is found in the wall? If it were the wall of the small intestine, mucosa, submucosa, smooth muscle, layer, and then what? Serosa, right? In other words, the wall contains all these layers. What muscles contain blood vessels? If the blood vessel is there, what does the blood vessel contain? Blood. So whatever you eat, therefore, will diffuse where? The glucose here will go where? To the blood. Do you understand? So, I think I like more. Mm. Mm. Go. Mm -hmm. Where does the glucose go? To the blood. In other words, the glucose will be found here. Where? In the blood. Now remember, the small intestine is 20 feet long. Right? Now, normally, if this were upper and lower limits of your blood glucose levels, 60 to 115 or 120, would be within the normal range. Anything below 16 would be what? Hypoglycemia. What does hypo mean? Low. Glycemia means blood sugar. Right? What about above 120? Hyper. Hyperglycemia. 
because later on we talk about all these tests, FBS 125, but that, that more or less, but we're, we're, we'll have a ballpark figure between 60 to 120. Easier to remember, right? Now, so if it's between this value, it's normal levels, right? Okay. So after a meal, the meal, or what I ate was Kit Kat, it contained what, glucose or sugar, right? Okay. So you would expect, let's say I, what time is it? It's 7.15, right? At 7.15, I had my bread and cookies and uh, Kit Kat. Within two or five minutes, what happens? It's absorbed. What happens to the blood sugar levels? It goes up about 120, maybe 200, 250. So what will the pancreas would do? What will the pancreas do in order to bring about equilibrium? So what is equilibrium? It goes up, you want it to go back to normal levels, right? Therefore, what will pancreas do? So the beta cells will secrete what? I. I, right? So I here, right? The beta cells here will secrete I, 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 which happens to be insulin, right? Now, the question is this. If this is insulin, what will insulin do? It's a key that opens what? The door of the cell membrane door, like this, right? So when you open the door, because of the presence of the key, which happens to be insulin, who will enter the cell? Glucose. Glucose. So the moment glucose enters the cell, what happens to the blood glucose levels? They start to drop. So from 200, it goes back to what? Normal levels. Do you understand? Okay. So in this case, I have nine doors. Ideally, how many keys of insulin should I need? Approximately, I'm just giving you a very simplistic way of discussing things in a simple manner whereby in order to facilitate the entry of this glucose, I, I need nine keys, but I only have nine doors. Now what happens in diabetes mellitus? You have three types, right? You have type one, type one, two, and then gestational, in pregnant women, right? In pregnant women who suffer from diabetes mellitus, it's called gestational diabetes, right? So when I put Chuck, if I'm recording, okay, good. So in type one, the mechanism, and if you have read this in the book, is one. Yes, Ms. Hardy up here? Autoimmune, auto okay, very good. See, autoimmune, which means, most, most likely this is usually seen in young onset diabetes or juvenile, like a child, a teenager, who suffers from diabetes, most likely had a prior one. Infection, it could be viral or bacterial, and the body developed an immune response in the form of antibodies and immune response which apparently destroyed the antigen, which happens to be what? The virus or bacteria. But unfortunately, not only did it attack the virus or bacteria, but this time it attacked its own self. Which part of the self? The beta cells. So therefore, the beta cells are completely what? Destroyed. And therefore, if the beta cells are completely destroyed, then guess what? Nice. Zero insulin will be produced, right? How much? Zero. Now the thing about this, therefore, is that, but the cell needs to survive. Without glucose, the cell will die. So what will the cell use as an alternate source of energy? Fat, the lipids. The thing about the utilization of fat as an alternate source of energy, you produce waste products or chemical products called ketone bodies, ketone bodies. And are they acidic? Yes, yes that's the reason why you develop what? Diabetic what? Ketoacidosis only in type one, okay? Only in type one, be aware of that, okay? Now, what about type two? In type two, there are two problems here. One of them is that in the this is, this is the adult onset. These are the old names: juvenile or young. Adult onset. The juvenile is also known as IDDM, which means 
insulin dependent diabetes mellitus, while adult onset is NIDDM, which means non insulin dependent diabetes mellitus. Now, why is it called non insulin? Because apparently the beta cells are still able to produce what? Little insulin. What do I mean by that? So, in terms of comparative analogy, here I needed what? Nine doors, I need nine keys. So here, maybe just for purpose of discussion, I only have how many what? Three keys. But I need what? For nine doors, will I be able to open the doors all at the same time? I cannot. Now, have you ever went, when you, when you go to a, uh, a movie house, and then when there's a lot of people, they open all the what? People selling tickets, let's say nine people are selling tickets, right? So the, the line becomes but very short, everybody gets to get a ticket, everybody enters the movie house. But what happens if instead of nine people selling tickets, you only have three selling tickets? What happens to the line? You have a long line of movie goers wanted to get a ticket. The same thing here. If you have nine doors and instead of nine keys, in you have only three, so it will take time to open each door. Glucose goes in, open. So what happens to the line of glucose? It becomes long. In other words, you still end up with what? Hyperglycemia, okay? Now, what's the other mechanism? Number two would be what? And I, I think I failed to mention this in the Tuesday class, is there is something wrong with the receptor. That means the cell is not responsive to insulin. In other words, if the receptors are defective, defective receptors, and there is insulin, what? It's not being able to be, what, responsive. The cell is not responsive to the insulin because there is something wrong with the receptor. Now, what do I mean by this? For example, I said to you that this is the key to open one. The door, right? And you see, I saw, showed you the groove, right? Okay. So the groove of the key matches the groove of the doorknob, right? So that it will be exact the same, right? To match, like a jigsaw puzzle. What happens if somebody today puts something there inside the doorknob, like maybe an epoxy that really hardens? Will this be able to enter this, the receptor? No. So which means that it will end up causing what? Failure for the opening of the door. Does that make sense? Okay. So in other words, either one, little engine has been produced, or two, there's something wrong with the receptors. And as far as the cell is no longer what? Responsive to the insulin, thereby not allowing the glucose to enter the cell. Now, nevertheless, there will still be hyperglycemia. So here, instead of developing diabetic ketoacidosis, what do you develop? Some folks would say honk. What is honk? Hyperosmotal, non-ketotic. Hyper or smaller means there's a lot of glucose here. Remember the word osmolarity, concentration. So you still have a lot of glucose molecules causing it to be concentrated. Just like I think the analogy I normally make is that if I have two glasses of water here, A and B. A, I put one teaspoon of sugar. In B, I put 10 teaspoons of sugar, which is more concentrated. B with 10 teaspoons of sugar, right? The same thing here. So you have hyper or smaller, non-ketotic. What does non-ketotic mean? Non-ketotic means there is no ketone bodies produced. Why? Because unlike in type 1, which is zero insulin and has to use alternate source of energy in the form of fat, there here there's no need. Because at least this glucose can enter the cell. But you have hyper or smaller non-ketotic. In the book, I believe it says hyper glycemic and non-ketotic syndrome, right? Okay? Does that make sense? Now, again, how would you know that this patient has diabetes aside from the blood sugar elevation? The signs and symptoms, right? Which includes what? The three P's, right? What are the three P's in diabetes? Polyuria. Polyuria. And because of these, increased urine output comes out. What else would happen? You develop what? Because you are thirsty, you develop what? Polydipsia. The moment you have polyuria, what would that lead to? Fluid volume overload or fluid volume deficit? 
deficit because you're losing water in the stool, or in the, in the urine, and thereby you end up with dehydration. And the hypothalamus in the brain can detect the fluid balance and says, hey, you know what, you need to what? Drink because you're thirsty, right? Okay. That's why you increase excessive thirst and what the for next one? Okay, what is polypagia for us? Anyone? Increase appetite. Why, why do you think that will happen? Can, can there be a possible scientific explanation? There must be a reason, right? Huh? Okay, dehydration will lead to increased thirst because you lose water, right? Dehydro, hydro means water. But we're talking about polyphagia has to do with what? Food, appetite, right? What is the satiety center or the center in the brain responsible for your appetite and satiety means being full? It can make you feel, oh, I'm still hungry or I'm still thirsty or no. So the, the hypothalamus, remember, is for both thirst and satiety center. Now remember class, in hyperglycemia on patients with diabetes, is the glucose able to enter the cell? No. Here, even so, zero. Here, little. So what will that make the hypothalamus think that you are what? Hungry as a whole, right? So you keep on what? You keep on eating, but the thing is, it even gets worse because especially if the food you eat has sugar, what happens with the blood sugar level? It still goes up. So in other words, there's so much food, the only problem is that the food cannot enter the cell. The glucose or sugar is outside the cell in diabetic patients. So it's like a term called hunger in the midst of plenty. You are hungry, but actually there's so much food outside the cell, the cell cannot enter, uh, the glucose cannot enter the cell, right? Do you understand? Now, now the mechanism of polyurea is very simple. If you remember, your nephron, Bowman's capsule, PCT, lupo Bendy, DCT, and the collective duct, the glomerular capillaries here. The capillary is a blood vessel called the glomerulus with the afferent, efferent arteriole. In hyperglycemia, there's a lot of glucose here, right? In the blood. Can that glucose or sugar be spilled into the urine? Yes, okay. So there's a lot of sugar here. Sugar, sugar, sugar. So this becomes what? More concentrated. Remember the, uh, the, uh, the principle of osmosis, okay? Whenever there's a lot of solute here, it will attract more water, right? So the water will what? Go there, from the peritubular like this, like this, like this. So what happens to the urinary output? High, it's what's called polyuria. Does that make sense? And not only that, when I was a young boy, my grandmother had what? Diabetes. What would, as I, I was very already, I was a keen observer of things happening around me. I noticed that the urine of my grandma, because we had a urinal, would all be what? Teeming with what? Who likes to eat or that's sweet? Ants, right? So I'm not saying if you, <laughs> if the ants start to go to your urine, that means what? It's sweet. Right, and, and it's a common finding. Of course, it's 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 scientific because why is it sweet? Because the sugar is in the urine, right? Okay. The bottom line, therefore, is that diabetic patients, if you allow the urine to be stored in a urinal, ants could go to them. So you have to really dispose them right away, right? Now, is that clear? Now, the thing about diabetic patient is that not only are pancreas are damaged but because of the effect of diabetes now and if you have watched the video I posted last night just there right? you notice that it affects the eye it's called diabetic retinopathy it affects your kidney it's called diabetic nephropathy some of them would end up with what chronic kidney disease and therefore they end up with end-stage renal disease right another one is Neuropathy, what is neuro? Nerve, which means that the nerves are damaged. What do they complain in their feet and legs? Numbness. So because of the numbness, guess what? They can't even feel. So say, do we recommend that they wake, walk barefooted? No, because the moment they, they 
do not have any slippers or shoes, they could step on something sharp, like a thumbtack perhaps, and end up what? With a foot injury that they don't even know that they have one, and it could be infected. The only thing too is that there is what? Slow healing taking place, why? In patients with diabetes, it has been shown that all the arteries of the body are affected because of it promotes what? Atherosclerosis, which means diabetes allows the deposition of what? Fat in the wall of the arteries of all the organs. So therefore, that is the reason why it's called microangiopathy, right? The small arteries, micro, and angio means artery, we have fat deposits and atherosclerosis in the wall. What happens to the blood flow? High or low? Decreased blood flow. So will there be decreased blood flow to the retina? Will the retinal arteries be affected? Yes. What about the renal artery to the kidneys? That's why it damages the kidney, it damages the eye. What about the arteries to the nerves? Definitely yes. Now remember, nerves are just like any organ, like you know, you know what? Muscle bone, nerve tissue, bone tissue, has to have what? <coughs> Arterial blood supply in the form of oxygenated blood. So the arteries are damaged, they have numbness. Uh, 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 nerves are damaged because of the lack of blood flow. And because of the atherosclerosis in the arteries of the lower limb, what happens to the, the feet? They could develop what, gangrene, right? Or if there's already an existing wound, that wound will not heal and within a couple of days from being color blue, lack of blood flow and oxygen become black. What does black mean? Dead, necrotic. And what do we recommend for diabetic foot patients? Patients with diabetic foot? Now why do we amputate? Because once that develops gangrene, it becomes infected. It can be a source of needles upon which bacteria can be attracted to that area. And you can develop an overwhelming infection. Now remember, Diabetic patients are usually what immunocompromised. So any form of infection, a small wound in the big toe, OMG, could kill your patient if you're not careful, okay? So that's the bottom line there. Now, another problem, especially among men is, and I mentioned this in the YouTube video last Tuesday, was you can develop erectile dysfunction, right? You do not, you do not have an erection and you develop impotence, why? because of the effect on the nerves for erection, which is parasympathetic nerves, nervi erigentes. Does that make sense? So in other words, I'm not saying all diabetic men have this problem, but it could be present in some cases of men with diabetes, right? So if you're married to someone with diabetes, it might affect your sex life, right? So instead of once a day, it might become once a year. I'm just kidding. Once a day, it might become what? Maybe once a week, if he can have an erection, right? So that's the bottom. So that's why in diabetic men, we have to make sure the blood sugar is controlled, You're taking their medications regularly, right? Now, so, I don't have to go in because I think there is going to be, is there somebody talking about diabetes today? Somebody, it's a group, right? So I don't have to go there, talk, we'll be talking about diagnostic procedures, fasting blood sugar, Oral glucose tolerance tests, you know, all, all these tests, the HB1AC, which was part of your um, signature assignment. The idea here is that we want to confirm whether you have diabetes or not, and if this diabetes is controlled in the next three months, like in HB1AC, the normal lifespan of a red blood cell, right? Three months, 120 days, right? Four months. So the idea, therefore, is this very simple. When you're dealing with diabetic patients, what would be the treatment of choice for type one? Insulin injections, no? Now, the best place to in inject insulin is where? Abdominal wall. So do not say stomach, because people, oh, stomach. The stomach is inside, how can I inject the, the insulin into the stomach? It's so deep. So the answer would always be what? Abdominal wall. Now look at my abdominal wall. It has so much what? Fat, right? Because apparently, the mode of injection would be what? subcutaneous, right, sub-Q. Remember the skin layers, epidermis? Epi, then what? Dermis, epidermis, dermis, and what is the third layer? Hypodermis. Hypodermis. Or what we call subcutaneous layer. What does sub mean? Subcutaneous means skin. 
So in fact, theoretically, there are only two layers of the skin. What are the two layers of the skin? Epidermis and dermis. This is technically not even part of a skin. But when we talk about anatomy of the skin, we have no choice but to talk about what? The hypodermis. Now, if you also recall, epidermis, there are no blood vessels, there is no blood flow, but the dermis and hypodermis as what? A lot of blood vessels, especially the hypodermis, a lot of blood vessels and a lot of fat, right? Do you understand? Now, so when we give this insulin to in here in the hypodermis, it can go what? Diffuse into where? The blood vessels. It goes into the blood and it goes here. It's the reason why it can lower the blood sugar, right? Now, again, I also mentioned this, that you have to rotate the injection sites. Why? If you keep on injecting on one side, let's say you divide the abdominal wall into what? Four quadrants. A vertical line and horizontal line passing to the navel. You end up with four quadrants, you have to rotate. If you keep on injecting on one side, you destroy the lipid layer or the fat. Because there's fat in the subcutaneous layer, and I mentioned this to be called what? Lipo what? Dystrophy, okay? So lipodystrophy, therefore, is the damage to what? To the fat there, if you do not rotate the injection sites. Now, we will not go into the details, but I, I think the, the, the group will talk about this, the uh, conditions such as the types of insulin, right? So there is what we call fast-acting, regular insulin, which means if you inject a drug called insulin, RI, or regular insulin, it could have an effect within what? Maybe two minutes, three minutes? So by the time you inject it, within two minutes, the blood sugar could start to go down. The only problem with fast-acting insulin, there's short duration, which means if I inject at, let's say, 7.30 in the morning, the effect could only be good for what? Up to 10. And the sugar starts to go up, so what do you need to do? Inject again, right? Because the duration of action, you understand what I'm trying to talk about? It's only good for three hours or four hours. So in order to avoid that, and I'm not sure because I, the last time I did the nursing review for our nurses, is they combine a fast acting with a slow acting, but what, what, what does the slow acting do? Longer duration, it will be good for 24 hours or one day. So once you inject, you can, you, the next injection will be the following day. But the problem with long duration acting drugs like this insulin, the onset of action is what? Slow. In other words, if I inject at 7.30, the effect will probably be at 9, and you'll already be dead because you have now what? Hyperglycemic coma. Your blood sugar is so high, right? So, long duration, but slow acting. You don't want that. So if you combine a fast acting but short duration with a slow acting but longer duration in one syringe, so when you inject, the fast acting component will act within two or three minutes, but the long duration acting component will last for 24 hours, so you will need to inject only how many times? Once a day. But they're actually both the same chemical called insulin, except that one is faster acting, one is slow acting. The fast acting is shorter duration of action, while the slow acting will be what? Longer, in other words, it will remain in the blood circulation and effectively within the 24 hours duration. You understand, okay? Now, can I give insulin type one? Yes, because there is zero. Can I give insulin in type two? Of course, yes, why? Because they have little. Now, which can be effective for hypoglycemic agents? Now, these hypoglycemic agents, you're probably familiar with them. We give this to diabetic patients. Hypoglycemic agents means they will lower the blood sugar that is elevated in diabetic patients. But they can only be effective where? Type 2, why? Because many of these drugs are designed to make the beta cells produce what? More. Produce more what? More insulin. In type 1, there is no way it can be done because how can you produce more when all the beta cells are already completely what? Destroyed. Is that clear? The idea, therefore, is that as I always make it clear in this class, if you know your anatomy and physiology, there is nothing that you cannot answer for the nursing board exam. 
you will pass. There is nothing you cannot answer. Because by knowing what is normal, then you know what is abnormal, right? Do you understand? Okay, now, let's move on to other endocrine disorders. And after diabetes, I would probably think of adrenal gland disorders, right? And let's go this to adrenal gland. Uh, before I forget, hopefully the, the group that will lecture or talk about diabetic patients, proper food care. It's a very common question in the nursing board exam. For example, if a patient is diabetic, are we going to make them wear tight-fitting shoes? No. Okay. Are we going to allow them to walk barefoot? I already said no, definitely, right? Okay, do you understand? Including the cutting of the nails. It should not be curved because if you curve, you may end up with an ingrown toenail. Right? It should always be straight. Does that make sense? Right? And I think there are even special socks for diabetic. When you go to Walgreens, diabetic socks, right? The ideal for diabetic patients. Okay, the next topic is about what? The adrenal gland. Remember, the adrenal gland is also known as suprarenal gland, and this gland is above what? The kidney, right? Okay, so the adrenal gland. That's two parts, right? Adrenal one, medulla, and the other one is what? Cortex. For the medulla, you have what? Adrenaline, what's another name for adrenaline? Epinephrine, right? And norepinephrine. The cortex has two parts. Glucocorticoid, or glucocorticosteroid, because it's a steroid preparation, derived from cholesterol or fat, which is also known as cortisol, and the other one is what? Mineralocorticoid or corticosteroid, which happens to be what? Aldosterone. Now, what would be the effect of adrenaline? Sympathetic, right? To increase heart rate, bronchodilate, right? Increase blood pressure. Cortisol as gluco mean glucocorticoid glucose glucose means what? Increase what? Blood glucose. Now remember this is a very important mechanism for what? Remember adrenal gland is important word sympathetic response. Remember survival you need sugar. What about aldosterone? One. Water what? Retention. And what else? Sodium retention. And finally, it promotes what? Potassium excretion by the kidney. The idea, therefore, is this very simple class. What I want you to understand is that by knowing that is the normal effect of these hormones, then you can know what happens when you have excess amount of the hormones, like in Cushing's, or decreased amount of the hormones when you see them where? in Anderson's disease, right? So, Cushing's disease is what? Increase of the adrenal hormones, right? So increased hormones of adrenaline, you have increased heart rate, increased blood pressure, right? What about glucose? High glucose levels, that would be called what? High for what? Glycemia. What about water? What? There will be increased water retention. That is fluid what? Overload or deficit? Hmm? Overload, definitely. So your blood pressure what? Can also go up. And you can have edema. Now what about retention of sodium? You retain sodium in the blood, but the kidneys, guess what? You develop what? Hyper. Natremia. And what is hypernatremia? Considering that the normal sodium level in the blood should be 135 to 145, then it would be greater than 145. Now, what is the effect of aldosterone and potassium? It makes the kidney excrete potassium where? In the urine. So if the potassium is in the urine, what happens to the blood potassium levels in Cushing's? High or low? High PO means low because the potassium is in the urine. Therefore, you develop a high PO 
which means hypokalemia means a decrease in your blood potassium levels. Normal potassium level ranges from 3.5 to 5. So it will be less than what? 3.5. Now, I, I, as I told the Tuesday class, I said, when you're preparing for the nursing board exam or core nursing quizzes or subjects, I suggest, because if you observe, it's the direct opposite. Where? Addison's. Here, high levels of the hormone. What about in, what happens in Addison's? Low, decreased levels of the hormones. So I don't have to write it down. So you would expect the heart rate to slow down. Instead of hyperglycemia, you have what? Hypoglycemia. Instead of water retention, you have what? Poly what? Polyuria. Is anybody going to talk about Addison's today? Nobody. But Cushing's, I think there is no, no one. Yes. In fact, in Addison, is what we call the Addisonian crisis. Because of polyuria, you have fluid volume overload or deficit? Fluid what? Deficit, because you have increased urine output. Can that lead to dehydration and hypovolemic shock? Yes, can that kill the patient? Yes. So, as I always tell you, anything that is life-threatening that will kill your patient, concentrate on those things in preparation for the nursing board exam. If you're smart enough to realize, oh my God, this can actually kill, then I have to be aware of the possibilities, right? It's called Addisonian crisis. What about the sonia levels? If the opposite, it will be less than what? 135, there will be hyponatremia, which lowers the levels of sodium in the blood. What about potassium? Hyper, the opposite, right? Eh? Greater than five. Milliequivalence, milliequivalence per liter. Now, you might say, no, do I really need to know this? Yes, if you want to pass your nursing board exam, pass core nursing. If you really do well here, you will have no problem with core nursing. But believe me. Because the concentration in core nursing is clinical conditions, case scenarios, and what are the expectations that we need to do. Now, even though the doctor orders things in the chart, but you need to know why did this doctor give this, this, and that. For example, we all know that the banana contains what? Potassium. So who do you think will ben benefit from giving a banana? Cushing's or Addison's? Of course, Cushing's, right? Why? Because the blood potassium level in Cushing's patient is low. Would I give banana for Addison's patients? So what happens in the nursing board exam? And that is one of the questions. And you said, yes, I will give potassium. What happens to the patient? Make it worse. Hyperkalemia can what? Can that kill a patient? Can the patient go into cardiac arrest? If you're watching the video I showed last Tuesday, remember the James Bond movies that I always talk about? In the olden ancient times, I mean in the 60s, we have these James Bond movies where Russians versus what? Amer American spies. And these spies, well, this is just a movie, but the problem, the thing about KCL or potassium chloride, KCL, potassium chloride, if you inject that, you could go into cardiac arrest, right? So some of these spies would inject, because it's transparent, it's like just like saline solution, and they go like this, they wear this white gown, and they pretend to be doctors in the hospital, and the whatever, Russian or American spy is lying down, so they put, inject them, and they die. The flat line will be seen on the cardiac monitor, okay? That's why whenever, now, who, who benefits with KCL? Cushing, right? So if the doctor orders that to be given, we have to put them on cardiac monitoring so that we can monitor if they're developing arrhythmias or they're going into cardiac arrest. You understand, okay? Is that clear? Now, especially if it's given in the IV, uh, the I intravenous, right? Now, do you, uh, so what am I trying to say? As future nurses, you are men and women of science. You have to have a logical mind, a smart, critical thinking mind. Because that is what we want in our nurses. We don't want incompetent nurses. We want our nurses to understand, why did I give a banana here? I gave a banana because why? The potassium levels are low. I will definitely not give a banana here in Addison's wife. 
the current potassium levels are already high. It's already what? It's just common sense. What is common sense? Critical thinking. But what is the basis for critical thinking? The right, appropriate knowledge that you learn from this class and future classes in core nursing. Does that make sense? Okay, now, I don't know this is part of trivia question. Who is the president of the United States who developed Addison's disease? Do you know? Okay, get your cell phone, Google it within five seconds. Addison's disease, U.S. president. While I drink my coke. Anybody? Only words like U.S. president, Addison's disease, John yes? Kennedy. Oh my goodness, you're so smart. Oh, actually, no, Google is so smart, thank you. John Gerald Kennedy, who is from Boston, which I come from, I'm just kidding, from Massachusetts, right? They come from a very prominent family. John F. Kennedy, because they're rich, once upon a time before World War II, I, I understand he went to London to study there. His father was the ambassador of St. James in London. He was the ambassador of the United States. And they were a very prominent family. And during this time, he developed signs and symptoms of Addison's disease. The good news at that time was that they were trying to develop this new drug in the 1930s called steroids. Now remember, what is this hormone? Corticosteroids, glucocorticosteroids, mineralocorticosteroids. So what did they do? They gave him this drug. So I presume at that time it was probably very expensive. Only the rich people could afford because when a drug is in the experimental initial stages, it usually is expensive until they mass produce and it becomes affordable. The bottom line is he survived. He was in World War II, he became a war hero and became president at a very young age. I think he was only 40 something, 42? Only to be assassinated one or two years later in where? Dallas, Texas. Right, you, you heard about his story, story, right? I was there. No, I was just joking. I was there in the movie. I saw the movie, okay. Or if you go to YouTube, all these shows. So the bottom line is that he was lucky because they were able to come up with this drug called steroids. Does that make sense? Okay, now let's move on to the next condition called SIADH, which I place in your study guide. And apparently, when, when you look at this, anti-diuretic hormone, anti means what? Against what? Diuresis. What is diuresis? Urination. Anti-urination, which means that this hormone produced by the hypothalamus, stored in the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland, will make the kidney what? Retain water. Right? Okay, so, you have two types of problems with ADH, okay? You have either what? SIADH, and what is the other one? Diabetes what? Insipidus. So which one will have low levels of ADH and which one will have high? Which one will have low levels? Diabetes. This one, low ADH. So what happens? Will you be able to retain water if you have low ADH? No. So you what? You have developed what? Polyuria. Because you cannot retain what? Water. That's probably the reason why people thought it was like diabetes mellitus. But the problem in mellitus is osmotic diuresis. Here is the problem is the lack of what? ADH. What about here? Hi, ADH, so you have fluid what? Retention. So you have fluid volume overload, here you have fluid volume what? Deficit, do you see the point? Does it make sense? Okay. What am I trying to show there for? There is nothing that you cannot answer. You would expect the blood pressure to be high because you retain water, here you can become what? Hypotensive, you develop hypovolemic shock. Does that make sense? Okay, is that clear? Now,
What about hypo versus, I think I did not include in the, in the study guide, hypo versus hyperthyroidism. Okay. Hypo versus hyperthyroidism, right? Thyroid, hyperthyroid. So in order to, easy for you, hyperthyroid means increase what? T3 and T4. What is T3? Try iodothyronine. And what is T, T4? Thyroxin. Now there's actually a third hormone called calcitonin, but I don't have to talk about that. Every time you think of these hormones, they're important for what? Cell metabolism. Now remember, in the first few chapters in this class, we define metabolism as the sum of all the chemical reactions taking place in the cell. It could either be anabolism to build or what? Catabolism to break down, okay? So in hyperthyroidism, everything is high. So you would increase what? Increase heart rate, right? You have tachycardia, right? What else? Increase peristalsis, you develop what? Diarrhea. And you'll notice in hypo, it's everything is what? Decrease heart rate. In hypothyroidism, low levels of the hormone, bradycardia. Here, what is it? Tachycardia. Here you develop, instead of diarrhea, what do you have? Constipation. Right? Here you have weight loss. What about um, on weight gain? What do you have here? Weight loss, maybe because of the diarrhea, of course, you lose weight, lose water, okay? What else, you have what? Here you have cold intolerance. Here, what do you have? So in other words, who do you think will benefit with a blanket or jacket? Hypo or hyper? Hypo, you need because they have cold intolerance, give them a blanket or a jacket. Is that part of nursing intervention? Yes. Will that come out in the nursing board exam? What we're trying to tell you therefore is that you have to have a scientific logical explanation of the things we do here in the hospital. Both nurses and doctors should be fully aware that these are present in your patients. Am I going to give a blanket here in patients with hyperthyroidism? No way, because they have heat intolerance. So when you say hypo, what are the common words? In adults, we also use the word what? Mixed edema. Right? So we have weight gain because we have to retain water. Edema, mixed edema, what else? In children, we call it what? Cretinism, right? Cretin. C-R-E-T-I-N and ac, cretinism. If this is seen in children, like an infant or child with hypothyroid, what happens if there's not enough thyroid hormones? Will that affect your brain cells? They become mentally retarded. They become very slow. What about your bone cells? Yes, that's why they become what? They suffer from dwarfism. The good news is that can we give hormone replacement for hypothyroid patients in the form of levothyroxine? Yes, we can. Like, as, as I shared last Tuesday, one of my cousins had a, you know, a child with this, so treatable with what? Hormone replacement. The earlier diagnosed, the better because they can live normal lives. So that person, my, 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 nephew, my niece now is normal, right? Okay, I think she's probably 5'6 five, or 5'5, five, five, but very tall, okay? So the, the bottom line is that you have to realize that whenever you have a condition like this, are we going to give hormone replacement here? Of course not, they already have high, high levels of the hormone, right? So what are the words associated with this? Graves disease. Right? What about toxic goiter? Toxic means increased levels. We say thyrotoxicosis, toxicity, toxic goiter, right? Graves disease, right? Here it makes edema and cretinism. Is that clear? Is that clear? Okay. So here, instead of giving hormone replacement for hyperthyroid, we give an anti-thyroid medication in the form of what? Propyl Now you have to worry about that. You can learn that later on. Propyl, P-R-O-P-Y-L, T-H-I-O, thiouracil, P-T-U, okay? Or tapasol or, you know, these are all drugs that are going to what? 
make sure that the hormone levels will go down. Is that clear? Is that clear? Okay. Now let's move on to GIT conditions. Let's just talk about hepatitis first. Of course, viral hepatitis. But uh, foodborne or waterborne contamination with the virus includes what? Hepatitis what? A and E. What about B, C, D? Blood exchange transfusions, which is blood being tainted with this virus. Or needles. Somebody has hepatitis, you, you get blood from them and you accidentally poke yourself, bang. You could also be infected. That's why, and that is a practice. Before you work as nurses, will you be given a vaccine against hepatitis B? Definitely, to protect yourself, right? Because you can never tell. Somebody put an, um, uh, did not put a sharps container on the needle and you get in poke, you can have what? Hepatitis B. How else? By sex, right? Because what happens in sex? She is a fluid, right? So therefore, you always practice safe sex. They use a condom, right? And make sure it's reliable. It's not that old, you know, because there might really be a hole, right? So, okay, what else? Now, in hepatitis, the danger is that, especially B and C and all these blood-borne hepatitis, it can lead to a chronic liver cirrhosis and liver failure, okay? And, and I gave this example last time. I said, in hepatitis, If you develop hepatitis, of course you develop jaundice, which is yellowing of the skin. So whenever you say jaundice, it's just yellowing of the skin. But the eye is not called jaundice because jaundice is skin, yellowing. Why? Because of the effect on the liver, you have high levels of bilirubin, which is a yellow pigment. Now, there are blood vessels in the skin and the eyes, so the bilirubin is in the blood, that's why you have yellow eyes. So what is the term used for yellow eyes? Icteric sclerae. So you don't just say yellow eyes. You know? What is it called? Icteric what? Sclerae. Then remember, normally the sclerae of your eyes should be white, right? So the moment it becomes yellow, it's called icteric sclerae. Now why is it bilateral? Because you have blood vessels on the left eye and you also have blood vessels while on the right eye. Does that make sense? Okay. And of course, all throughout the body. Now, one of the very common questions asked is, what about in African-American patients where their skin is dark? How can you detect if they have jaundice? Can anybody tell me? Yes, aside from the eye. The skin of what? The palm of the hand and then what? The plantar aspect of the feet. Like me, I have dark, dark skin, so it might be harder, right? So. But of course, you can see my eye, it's enteric steering. Okay, now, one of the things you might be able to do, I really need all, all this term, Dr. Gum, because in the nursing board exam, they won't be using the word yellow eyes. And you keep on looking for the word yellow eyes, but it's not there, right? So you have to know that it's called enteric steering, right? Do you understand? Now, what happens when you have this condition, okay? Now remember, if you remember, the liver is on the right upper quadrant, right? The liver is here. There's a vein called the hepatic portal vein. Now, the hepatic portal vein is not the same thing as hepatic vein. The hepatic portal vein is unique because instead of bringing the blood to the heart via the vena cava, inferior vena cava, the blood from the small intestine is brought where? Where, where? It's called the portal vein or hepatic portal vein. So the hepatic portal vein is not the same as the hepatic vein. So whatever nutrients that are absorbed here, they are brought via the portal vein in the liver to be stored, like your glucose will be stored in the form of glycogen for future use. Same thing with the fats and proteins, right? Now, this portal vein is brought about by what? Splenic vein, spleen, esophageal, esophageal veins, from the stomach to the esophagus, from the superior mesenteric vein, or SMV, and the splenic vein has a tributary called inferior what? Mesenteric vein. The superior mesenteric vein usually comes from the upper GI tract, the small large intestine portion, upper. Here is the lower portion of the GI tract. So these veins coming from the small and large intestine and the lower part of the large intestine will all bring the blood and to the liver. Bring the water there, bring all the nutrients there, right? 
What happens when you have cirrhosis? You develop what? Scar, right? What is scar? Scar is fibrosis. Cirrhosis is fibrosis of the tissues in the liver. So it gets damaged. So if you have blood here, the blood is supposed to go here. This is destroyed. Can the blood enter in the liver? No, it won't. It goes back here. And remember, we talked about this before. But there's a lot of blood in a blood vessel. What happens to blood pressure? Increased blood pressure is called what? Portal hypertension. You understand? So whenever there is portal hypertension, it presupposes that there is something wrong with what? Liver in the form of cirrhosis. Now, if the blood cannot enter the liver, but goes back here, the blood pressure goes up, the blood pressure will allow to what? Bring back the blood where here. And the blood with fluid in them, in the form of plasma, will increase the size of the spleen. It's called splenomegaly. The problem is that when the moment you have splenomegaly, it will sequester or trap all the blood cells, including red blood cells. So they develop anemia. The white blood cells will be lower. It's called leukopenia. What about the platelet count? Low, thrombocytopenia. In other words, what is it called when they have low red blood cell, low white blood cell, and low platelet? Pancytopenia. Can that be seen in patients with liver cirrhosis and portal hypertension? Yes. What about the blood going here? Can that go, goes here to the esophagus? What do you develop? Like a varicose vein. So every time the blood pressure goes up, goes up, this, the veins, that would take like a varicose vein on the wall, gets bigger like a balloon, and then what? Ruptures, you vomit blood. It's called hema emesis. Emesis means to vomit. Hematemesis with the letter T in between hema and emesis. Hematemesis. They can also have blood in their stool. What is that called? Melina. Black tar. You know what's tar? Like the road asphalt stools. It's usually from upper GI bleeding, like slow, like in your really viruses. And or you can have what? What is hematokesia? Cherry red blood in the stool. Why is it cherry red? Because it's what? Fresh. Cherry red. And usually it comes from lower GI bleeding. It starts with the lower part of the duodenum, jejunum, ileum, and the rest of the large intestine, right? So the idea, therefore, is that can this be life threatening? Liver failure, liver cirrhosis, portal hypertension, bleeding esophageal viruses. Definitely, okay? So you need to know, okay? So you also end up with, going back here, you develop uh, hemorrhoids because you have hemorrhoidal veins. The veins that are filled with blood, you have hemorrhoids, and there is what they call the umbilical vein, which is supposed to be closed. It starts to open up because of the excess blood you develop. Like this, it's called caput medusae, okay? The idea, therefore, is these are manifestations of what? Portal hypertension. So, have you noticed here, every time we see or discuss a clinical condition, we talk about signs and symptoms, you need to be able to explain in a scientific way how come there is splenomegaly, how come there is what? Esophageal virus that could actually bleed when they rupture, how come there is hemorrhoids, how come there is kaput may I just say? Because if you can answer that without looking at your notes, then you are really smart. You are ready to take the board exam. You are ready to become a nurse. But if you just simply memorize without understanding the reasons why they develop, it will be very difficult to pass a board exam, right? So deep learning, that's why the advantage of maybe hopefully in, in, in blended learning is that you on your own initiative will read and study on your own. Now, my role is just to explain and discuss things. Now, some of you like me to talk about the whole time, but in the past, I would lecture from what? 7 to 11. Now, it's just about from 7 to 8 or 8.30, right? The rest, you should have read on this ahead of time. And this is also the advantage, because before, <laughs> if I talk on this topic today, and ask the students, how many of you have read the book? Zero, why? Because they're busy studying for what? For the quiz, right? Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, the, 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 the past. So the, the, the lecture for the day, nobody will be reading on them. Now, you are forced to read because you are supposed to do the discussion board. At the same time, you watch the videos on the, the chapters, right? Which is good. So I would be sure before you come to look at the stitchback, 
you already have a general idea of what the topic would be about, right? Because you were asked and re are required to read beforehand. So what I do is just to clarify things with this teach back, okay? Now, what about some of ulcers? It's associated with what organism and what bacteria? Okay, what? Helicobacter, bacteria. Helicobacter pylori. Why? Where is the pylorus? That's the last part of the stomach. It would pack the bacteria there. And as I told the other class this Tuesday, I said, as a former of medical, when I was a medical student in the 1980s, 84, 81 to 85, it would be stupid to give what antibiotics to stomach ulcer, right? But now we give, why? Because there is a bacteria that promotes the development of stomach ulcers. It's called H. pylori, or Helicobacter pylori. So not only do you give antacids, or you give those tagamets, imetidine, or sucralfate, the thing is now we also even give antibiotics, right? Because of the H. pylori present in the stomach. And of course, the second, of course, the most obvious would be what? Hyperacidity. In fact, in severe cases of stomach ulcers due to Hyperacidity, with, uh, we cut the vagus nerve. Why, why do we cut the vagus nerve? It's called vagotomy. Because the vagus nerve promotes more, what, more acid secretion by the stomach. Remember, cranial nerve number what? 10, vagus. What happens in vagus stays in vagus. It's the longest cranial nerve because it goes all the way to the stomach and the small and large intestine. Okay? Is that clear? So why are we concerned about stomach ulcers? Because they could actually what, bleed. Why? If this is the stomach wall, the, the ulcer gets deeper and deeper. It will not remember the layers? Mucosa, submucosa, smooth muscle, serosa. Are there blood vessels in the smooth muscle layer? Yes. So if the ulcer gets deeper, can that expose the blood vessels? Can you have a bleeding stomach ulcer? Yes, you can. So you can again have hematemesis, vomiting of blood, or melina or hematochesia. Does that make sense? Okay. And of course, the procedure to diagnose would be what? Gastroscopy. Insert the mouth into an endo endoscope in order to visualize if there is an ulcer, how big it is. Unfortunately, now be, be aware of these. Stomach ulcers, you have to monitor them because they might develop into a gastric cancer or carcinoma, so be aware of that, okay? Now what about reflux, esophagitis, or heartburns? The problem is where? The sphincter. It's also known as cardiac sphincter because it's, what is the first part of the stomach? Cardiac region. What is the la last part of the stomach? Pyloric region or pylorus. The cardiac region has an opening called cardiac orifice. What guards that orifice? The circular muscle called sphincter. So what happens is that when the food enters the esophagus and goes to the stomach, it is mixed with hydrochloric acid. What do the sphincter do? Contract to close so that it will not backflow or it will not reflux or regurgitate. Now, the problem is this. What happens if the sphincter is not working properly? Then you have what? Reflux. Acid reflux. You develop reflux esophagitis. The esophagus becomes inflamed. That's why there's chest pain. That's why it's called the heartburn. But there's really nothing wrong with the heart. Where's the pathology? In the inflamed esophagus. Do you understand? Okay? Is that clear? Now, in cases of gallstone, where, is the, where does the gall's bladder? In the right upper quadrant, you have gallstone, you have gall pain, uh, gallstone pain because of biliary obstruction, right? Okay. And can we remove that? Yes, we can with what surgery? And as I shared with last Tuesday's class, I said before, it will take one week. After the surgery, you have to take one week because you have a big incision here in the hospital for one week. Now, you don't even have to be hospitalized. It's called, I, I was joking about in and out burger. You go in the morning, you go out in the afternoon, or even late evening. Because they have three, four holes, and then they put a new more put air so they can spread out the small intestine, and then they can now remove the gallbladder to the small hole, and then suture and tie, and then you can go home. Good for you, good for the hospital. Make more money for the hospital because they don't have to let you stay for a week. They don't have to pay a nurse to take care of you. Everything is made oral antibiotics. Do you understand, okay? So that is what it is. Now, again, when we're dealing with GI conditions, now you just have probably read on Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. In ulcerative colitis, inflammation of the colon, which can develop also ulcers, you get a bloody diarrhea. Okay, so that's one thing you have to be aware of, okay? The, the idea which is 
acute gastroenteritis, it is what? Increased peristalsis, you develop diarrhea with watery stools, you can become dehydrated, that's why you have to have fluid replacement. If there is a need to give antibiotics, then do so. For acute gastroenteritis due to bacterial infection, okay? Is that clear? Okay, I think I can stop there. We can have a, a short five minute break. When you come back, we can have a quiz, okay?